stretch out the lecture theatre and he always had us in, in fits of laughing but you know you were held in such high esteem as well Dean so it's really brilliant that you're back here and uh, this sounds like an excellent topic and I'll, I'll just hand over to you if that's okay right. and we'll do questions at the end. Thanks very much Sarah yeah, indeed. Yeah. Thank you all for coming and um, as you all know I, I'm going to be talking tonight about um, quite an extraordinary man um, who essentially dedicated his entire life to uh, scholarship and research on the history, archaeology and folklore, I suppose, um, of various parts of Ireland, but particularly, uh, of course, uh, of uh, County Clare. And indeed, uh, many people are under the impression, and it's very understandable, uh, that in fact uh, Thomas Johnson Westrop was a Clare man. Um, he had a lot of family uh, connections in Clare, two of his sisters uh, married, one of them sat pools uh, near Ennis and the other the O'Callaghan's near, near uh, Tulla and he often spent time with, with, with um, his sisters um, and a great deal of his publications of course were also in Clare. But as a Limerick man I must uh, <laughs> stress he, he actually was uh, a Limerick man. Uh, he was born, um, this is one of the more flattering uh, photographs that we have uh, of him. Um, very much a, a Victorian gentleman uh, of the period and whatever but uh, I'm always conscious of the care he seems to have taken with trimming his beard and that sort of thing. And uh, I was saying to Sarah, we don't really have any surviving letters or uh, diaries as an adult or anything else, so it's difficult to kind of get inside his skin. So I'm always looking for um, clues uh, from, from things like photographs and, and whatever there. Mm -hmm. um, he was born here in um, Atty Flynn, which is the family home, just a few miles outside of uh, Patrick Square. The Westrops were um, an English family, in, originally from Yorkshire, and they liked to claim at any rate that they went back to the 13th century and whatever. Uh, whether they do or don't, um, the, their association with uh, Ireland uh, is as Cromwellians. Um, the earliest man from the Westrop family uh, in Ireland was Montefort Westrop, and he washes up in Limerick City towards the end of the Cromwellian period. Um, he's not a soldier, certainly not at that stage. Um, he's really... Um, kind of a tax collector and administrator is the controller of the port of Limerick uh, at the end of the Cromwellian period. But like all, or virtually all the Cromwellians, they managed to survive the demise of Cromwell and the restoration of the monarchy and the Westrops do quite well in the what we call the restoration period um, under the reign of Charles II from 1660 uh, onwards. Um, Montefort Westrop and his sons, they acquire quite a bit of land initially in Clare and then eventually in 1703 they acquire the Atty Flynn uh, estate. Um, now our friend Westrop T.J. Westrop, he was always very proud of the fact that his family had never got land through plantation schemes and he used to emphasise that any land the family had, that they had bought it. Um, which is true, uh, but it, it is a kind of special pleading of course, because for example uh, the Atty Flynn estate, that had been confiscated <laughs> by William of Orange after the Battle of the Boyne and all that war. And uh, to raise money, uh, William of Orange put the confiscated land up for sale. Uh, so yes, the Westrops bought it, but it was land that had 
been taken from their uh, original uh, owners. The Atiflin estate wasn't huge, just shy of 600 acres. But um, by the time we get to um, Westrop's uh, father, John Westrop, um, <coughs> he has um, one way or another about 3,000 acres in Clare. And uh, in fact, um, the Westrops at one stage had about, it's calculated around 7,000 acres in various parts of Clare. Um, the John, John Westrop, uh, our friend's father, um, suffered during the famine and um, he sold quite a bit of the land in Clare um, in the 1850s uh, there was a thing called the Encumbered Estates Court that allowed landlords who were in financial trouble as many of them were after the famine to uh, actually uh, sell the estates so um, our Westrop grew up in a comfortable landlord family, not, not huge landlords, but certainly uh, a privileged uh, person. Um, his father uh, married initially uh, a good Clare woman, Georgina Stamer, one of the Stamers of Carnelli, and they had uh, in all um, ten children. Uh, three of them uh, died as infants and um, the surviving uh, family, first family, there were four sons and uh, three uh, daughters. Um, Georgina Stamer died, uh, she was actually a first cousin uh, of her husband's, and she died in uh, 1852, and a couple of years later he remarried. Presumably, uh, being married to his first cousin, in the first marriage was agreeable to him because when he took a second wife, she was also a first cousin, but um, a different first cousin, so to speak. Uh, she was Charlotte Whitehead. Uh, she'd been born in India. She came from an English military uh, family. They married in 1856. Uh, she had a daughter who died as an infant, and in 1860, uh, she had her only surviving child, uh, our friend Thomas Johnson uh, Westrop, who was born on the 16th of uh, August uh, in uh, 1860. Um, so he grew up uh, in Atty Flynn, um, seems to have had a quite close relationship with all of his stepbrothers and sisters, and um, but the mother certainly uh, doted on him and he was extremely close uh, to him. This is one of the surviving portraits we have of him as a young fellow. Uh, today I suppose they'd be ringing child eye and whatever <laughs> about all of this but in the Victorian era little boys were actually dressed as girls. Uh, uh, yeah, Up to around the age of seven or something like that it seems to have been a quite a common practice uh, to, to have them uh, uh, dressed in clay. And what he bought, did he say? Mm -hmm. Did they dress the children like that? Like, 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 as girls. As Victorian. girls, yeah. yeah. Will know. Um, the, um, if, if, if I were into psychohistory, you'd be drawing all kinds of conclusions about what happened to him for the rest of his life. And he uh, never went to school, um, again, as a privileged um, son of aristocrats. He was uh, educated at home, initially by his mother, and then uh, they had uh, a number of um, live-in tutors. Um, one of them, a man called Mr. O'Sullivan, who, despite his name, seems to be a Protestant. He was a um, graduate of Trinity College, and uh, he certainly had a major influence on the young Westrop. We know something about his childhood and his teenage years because he kept a diary as um, basically, I mean, the concept, the word teenager, would mean nothing to him. But uh, basically, in his teen years, he kept this diary, which um, survives and gives some insight. And um, obviously, again, um, modern psychological approach to 
teaching young people um, didn't work for Mr. O'Sullivan. And in the diary, as you see, um, he constantly criticised it. A fear he found me a precious blockhead. I never knew him speak of me as otherwise than densely stupid and idle. So now all this modern psychology and education <laughs> um, uh, seeing what he achieved uh, afterwards. Uh, in, in other parts of the diary, he refers to himself um, kind of tongue-in-cheek as that worthless fool Tom. Uh, but obviously, yeah, he was parroting something that had been um, 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 uh, said um, to him uh, in, in, in his childhood. You get some um, insights into his character. I picked one uh, quotation from the diary, which is um, he, he goes to church on Sunday, the day after St. Patrick's Day, and he records in the diary about the uh, Protestant clergyman. On Sunday, Mr. Gubbins gave us a 40 minute long sermon on St. Patrick, King Caroticus, Odin, Palladius, the decree of Hadrian, the burning of Rome, Caesar's commentaries, the Shamrock, the Arians, the Arian races, the Colosseum, the Hill of Tara, Baal, Belial, etc., etc., and proving that St. Patrick was not a gentleman, but a Protestant. And um, uh, perhaps even though um, he's poking fun at the clergyman, perhaps he as well as Mr. O'Sullivan may have been formative influences uh, um, uh, on him, as indeed uh, was his mother. And that's a <coughs> nice photograph we had of him with his mother um, when he's uh, in, in um, Trinity College. Um, as I say, the tutor stays with him until he's 18. Um, he then applies to Trinity College, and the diary actually has very interesting information on uh, getting admitted to Trinity, uh, taking exams and, and the procedure and whatever. Again, he says, everybody assured him he, he had absolutely no hope of being accepted by Trinity. Um, seems more of the uh, Mr. O'Sullivan kind of um, encouraging him by criticizing him. But in fact, um, he did gain admission, and he went in uh, 1879 to uh, Trinity. Now, before that, his father had died. The father died um, in uh, 1876, um, and um, the mother moved uh, because in those days, once the father uh, and the husband died, then it's the eldest son is going to inherit. And uh, But she made some kind of agreement with her uh, stepson, Sion, for a while. And then she moved across the road to this house, Springford, um, where um, our Westrop and the mother uh, lived together until 1879, as I say, when she went to Trinity. Luckily, both these houses, both Attie Flynn and Springford, uh, not only still survive, but are very well maintained mm -hmm. and, and um, there. Um, he seems to have a very successful uh, career in Trinity. Uh, he uh, studies what we call uh, arts degree first, and then once he has obtained his BA in 1882, he then proceeds to study civil engineering and qualifies as a civil engineer in uh, 1885. And there's a um, graduation uh, picture uh, of him. As soon as he goes to Trinity, Mama follows him to Dublin and uh, they rent a house in uh, Monkstown, 13 Trafalgar Terrace, which kind of uh, gives you an, an insight in immediately into um, the kind of suburb they, they uh, uh, moved into. And uh, he uh, lives there with her uh, until she dies in uh, 1891. He, as soon as he qualifies as an engineer, he uh, does a kind of uh, work placement, I suppose you would say today, or uh, apprenticeship with a very distinguished um, Dublin um, civil engineer, um, Bindon Blood. Stoney. Um, 
his mother was actually one of the Bindon bloods from Clare, so that, that connection uh, uh, may have been there. He was the chief architect of the Dublin Port and Docks Board and, um, as I say, um, a very distinguished man in, in his own right. And um, after his apprenticeship, Westrop gets a job with um, uh, what we now call Mead County Council. And he does some work, doesn't much information about it, uh, seems to have worked on river drainage. Um, but very quickly, um, he either tires of that or he decides um, that what he really wants to do is pursue what has really from his teenage years been his great interest. That is going out into the field, looking at castles, looking at monuments, um, looking at uh, anything uh, archeological or whatever, um, talking to local people, getting information on folklore, all of the things that he was to become um, an expert on. Um, they're really there and you can see it in the diary from uh, his earliest years. Um, his first contact with the Burren uh, is in 1878, when he, um, he really is on his way to the Iron Islands, basically. But um, um, he does um, a tour around the Burren, and already, even at that stage, he's only 17, just going on 18. Um, on that Burren trip, he starts drawing, uh, sketching, and making notes for it. And uh, clearly that interest uh, is there very strongly and <coughs> very quickly, within it would appear a year or two of uh, working as an engineer, um, he gives it up and devotes the rest of his life to um, this academic uh, and practical study. Um, He's obviously independently wealthy enough to do that. It's very hard to um, get any information about how that worked. Uh, obviously, when the mother died in 1891, uh, he certainly inherited uh, probably substantial money from her. And certainly, when he dies, um, his will uh, shows that he had very, very extensive um, kind of investments. Now, he may have been good at doing the stock exchange or whatever, but um, whatever the details, uh, he was able to devote his life and presumably have a reasonable, comfortable life without having to work. He never married, so maybe that helped, um, <laughs> but um, the um, uh, details of, of, of that. In, it's interesting, you look him up in the census, in uh, the 1901 census, he describes himself as a civil engineer and an editor. Uh, when you come to the 1911 census, it's kind of reversed. He describes himself as a writer on uh, antiquarian issues and civil engineer. He still keeps the civil engineering qualification, but there's no evidence that he ever again uh, uh, actually worked uh, uh, for that. Um, he immediately then um, begins to uh, start to publish and um, alongside his continuing research and field trips and whatever, he begins this um, extraordinary really um, um, record of um, research work and uh, publication. Um, I've tried analysing his work and um, you can certainly say that when he begins, he starts to publish from the uh, early 1880s and far about the first decade, he's really um, either writing on pure history subjects, things like medieval sources or building, he devotes a lot of time to describing uh, friaries and abbeys. Uh, particularly in Clare and in uh, Limerick, and um, writes a good bit about medieval sources uh, and what's available, um, as well as the beginnings, really, of fieldwork. 
And then from, certainly from 1893, when he, he writes a note about Ugringe, uh, from then on, his concentration really is on prehistory, prehistoric monuments, and uh, focusing particularly, of course, uh, on County Clare, and in particular uh, on the Burn. He describes the Burn as um, a museum of living history, um, with which, of course, it was. If you add everything up, uh, you come across the most extraordinary figure of perhaps 300 publications. Now, not all of them, not all of them, of course, are major uh, works. Some of them are notes and, and explanations and shorter things. Um, but all of them of interest and all of them coming from um, uh, research. But certainly of that, as I say there, 53 of them are major uh, pieces of research and publication on prehistoric monuments. And he has really 12 major articles um, on the archaeology of the Burren. Uh, he has 22 separate papers on medieval churches, 20 of them on promontory forts. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, which is one of his really pioneering um, uh, research projects, 13 of them on castles. And he had, alongside all of that, continuing interest all the time on folklore, and particularly on the folklore of Limerick and Clare, and um, predominantly, perhaps, on Clare. Uh, he publishes most of his work in the learned journals of the day, the Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy, and the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. He never actually publishes <coughs> what we call a book, um, though his study on uh, the prehistoric forts of Ireland, that was, it was published in journal form, and uh, it was kind of bound together uh, eventually. Um, and he has one or two small kind of uh, pamphlet publications. But all of his important work really is in these learned journals. Now again, uh, some of them I've noticed were uh, rewritten for, particularly the Limerick ones, they're rewritten for um, the North Munster Antiquarian Journal, um, or its predecessor, which had a different name, which was the publications of the Thomond uh, Archaeological Society uh, in Limerick. And he also had the practice of, um, you know, because some of his work is quite dense and scholarly and um, going into um, uh, medieval sources and he had a good knowledge of Latin, for example. He sometimes then popularized them for newspapers and uh, particularly his County Clare work, you find it in, in a more uh, accessible form in uh, the Clare Journal in, in, in particular. Um, I, for the purpose of this talk, I had a, a closer look at uh, his uh, Clare publications, uh, the various <coughs> surveys and articles, and again, extraordinary total of 145 of them, uh, uh, including the notes, what he wrote there. His very first publication actually was on County Clare, on uh, Queen Friary. This is the period when he's describing the abbeys and the buildings. Um, and uh, again, you get a, a quite an important description in 1889 of Innes Friary, and then he has notes on uh, the Spanish Armada ships and what had happened to them. And he, again, showing from an early stage the kind of range and, and scope of his work. 1891, he has um, a very um, uh, purely historical study of uh, sheriffs in County Clare. Um, Next year and the year after, he has a couple of articles on uh, Killaloo, uh, describing the cathedral and talking about um, uh, what he calls the palaces uh, in the area. And then, as I said earlier, from 1893 onwards, it's prehistory that predominates. Uh, surveys, um, going around in the field, um, photographing, measuring, sketching, drawing, um, uh, uh, all of the uh, surviving um, archaeological monuments. Major work on the stone forts, 
uh, divides it up in different parts of the country, 1893 and what he calls uh, Central Clare, 1896, um, does a study of the Loop Head area, uh, 1901, North West Clare, 1905, what he describes as the borders of Burren, uh, locally 1913 here in Finn, more work on the Burren in 1915, 1916, um, you know, not that long before his death, um, he's still in the field and doing work around uh, Iron Climber uh, area. 1901, he has a major work on what he calls the Catters of County Clare, which is um, um, basically, he, he has terminology of, of the time and whatever. Catters really are the forts, stone forts of the ring forts. Uh, again, uh, 2,420 of them, uh, which he details, goes into their names and what they mean, the features of it, provides, um, if there's a bibliography of people have written about it before, he includes that. Again, his uh, major work on the burn appears in separate publications, 1895, 98, 99, and again, there's a break when he's doing other things and he comes back to them in, in, in 1911. So, um, extraordinary um, uh, range uh, of, of work. And again, you have to consider uh, um, he has to go around, he has to get from place to place, he has to come down on the train. Now, he does have the West Clare Railway and whatever to, to help, um, but it's Pony and Trap and um, I've never come across any reference to him using a bicycle or whatever um, he may, but um, you don't get that. Uh, his great friend, um, uh, Dr. McNamara from this area again, he eventually had a motor car and um, in the later period from around 1911 onwards, there are some references to uh, mainly uh, Dr. McNamara's car breaking down um, uh, on that. Um, there's no end to the Clare publications, really. Um, a very important one uh, on churches with wrong towers in North Clare in 1894. He has one in 1900. More work on the churches of Clare and very um, original historical research on um, ecclesiastical divisions and uh, his knowledge of Latin or whatever was very useful for him there. Rainforts of East Clare, you can see there. And then, of course, there is um, all the work on folklore that, that, that he did, um, collecting uh, folklore. Um, this really from around 1910 um, onwards, right up to the outbreak of the First World War, um, uh, this great folklore survey, which, which as you probably know, is published by CLASP uh, publications in Venice. Um, again, he did very interesting work on St. McCullough of Tulla. Um, and um, he also published, interestingly enough, um, material on Clare in the uh, Limerick Journal, um, which I don't think everybody is uh, often aware of. Presumably his output was so extensive that the editors of the learned journals couldn't keep up with him. He'd be filling every journal with his own work. So some of the Clare work actually appears in, in the uh, Limerick Journal. Um, work on Milton Malvish, you can see there. Uh, Eastern Varna, the Hinch, and the Holt, the Key. Um, all of that, uh, again, during, during that period, appearing in uh, Limerick journals. Again, he has a study of cysts, dolmens, and pillars, which he publishes in 1902. Uh, he writes about the castles of Clare in 1899, and he has an interest in the articles on the Mahire in 1896. And as you say there, <laughs> at this stage, I gave up going through all of his Clare stuff. And um, <laughs> I'll stop boring you with it as well. But you certainly get 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 um, the picture uh, of, of of his work. Um, apart from Clare and Limerick um, and local kind of surveys, um, I suppose the major publications that he produced uh, first of all would be on promontory forts. 
promontory forts were hardly studied at all uh, in before his time. Um, you know, promontory forts, the, they're these kind of defended promontories or um, kind of um, cliffs. And he sometimes called them cliff forts or, or, or whatever. And uh, indeed, I think one could say that promontory forts haven't been studied very much since his time either, um, that his work is still the major um, uh, study of them. And this involved um, really traveling the whole country um, to uh, do the research uh, uh, for that. He was asked to be involved with a survey of Clare Island, which he worked on for two years between 1909 and 1911. And his publication on his work on that uh, comes to nearly 80 pages um, of that. There were other people, uh, um, uh, botanists and various other people involved with the Clare Island survey as well. But he, he did the um, archaeology um, site. Um, again, he produced uh, a full list in 1899 of all the surviving round towers in Ireland and uh, very interestingly also provided notes from uh, historical researchers on round towers that no longer existed that had actually been demolished by his time. Again, uh, of major value. Again, he has uh, a fascinating paper, nearly 70 pages, on uh, early Italian maps of uh, Ireland in the medieval period, between 1300 and 1600. And uh, in addition to uh, detailing and reproducing the maps, he has very valuable notes on um, settlers in Ireland and traders from uh, Europe uh, in that period. And his other major work, um, of course, is, which is very well known, which is um, um, a major study of what he calls the ancient forts of Ireland, um, coming to 147 pages, and would still be a work of reference for um, all kinds of scholars down to the present day. Um, he was very involved with and supported by and in turn supported the uh, Royal Society of Antiquaries. Uh, he was created a fellow in 1893. He was the president of the uh, society on two separate occasions. Uh, and they were really the uh, major um, scholarly body uh, of that period. He took charge of their photographic collection which is very important. He indexed the journal and worked as one of the committee for the publication and indeed was involved with various other um, um, committees of the Right Society of Antiquities. Here he is out in the field, um, suggesting maybe he had a sense of humour um, that doesn't necessarily come across in his work. He's in some unidentified um, probably um, make a little tomb in the barn uh, <coughs> there. Um, it's certainly. That's uh, a, a cave up above Alwy. Really? Is yeah. that it? Is that Alwy Mountain? Mountain. Uh, right. That's above Alwy. Uh, Is it Monin, no? Um, Monin cave? Yeah, by the Mill Depression. It's Mill Street. Yeah. Uh, do you know that, where that is? Again, it's, it's uh, obviously... Um, Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. right. um, is that? Again, uh, one of the wonderful things that survive um, in the Library of the Royal Irish Academy are many of his field notebooks. Um, some, there are some of these in private hands and some occasionally some of them come up for auctions as well because eventually... Um, um, what he didn't donate to um, the Royal Irish Academy and whatever uh, sometimes was kept by his uh, relatives and uh, got lost. But the main, the main point of putting that up is to show <laughs> the uh, wonderful detail of his work. Um, you know, the amount of information uh, crammed into the pages and illustrated all the time by these wonderful drawings, uh, detailed plans, sketches, uh, whatever. Um, 
his mother was a kind of amateur artist and he seems to have been trained as um, an artist or certainly on sketching from a young age and then of course his training as a civil engineer uh, benefited his ability to produce uh, the detailed um, um, drawings which are still of such value to um, archaeologists and people examining things and any time any of his drawings and measurements have ever been checked by modern scholars they've always been shown to be um, extraordinarily accurate so he was um, absolute detail again just uh, showing his ability to sketch um, the um, round tower in um, uh, where is it? Mm -hmm. I and uh, he has one in Cork and Limerick. But again, the point of this is to show the ability to sketch mm -hmm. and, and convey uh, our uh, mm -hmm. travel. Again, drawings um, of um, detail of windows, um, again, from his publications. So, you know, Robin X doorways and uh, all of that is perfect detail, so it's such a wonderful um, um, uh, ability to sketch and uh, convey things. Again, um, plan of Cannon Island. Um, again, he has to get out there to do this work and, and whatever. And uh, again, the scale is perfect. The showing the different periods that he uh, recognized. And again, the detailed uh, measurements. 85 feet by 23 feet, three inches. You know, there's nothing about mm. uh, approximations or anything else. Mm. He's going to ac absolutely get it, get it, get it right. And it even gives you the impression of um, where, you know, at his time, some of the ruins are overgrown or whatever. Mm. Uh, that, that's actually conveyed. One of the curious features of many of his plans and drawings is um, this. Uh, this kind of signature, which um, is a kind of swastika, I suppose, with, with a seven on it. You haven't an explanation of that for me, have you? <laughs> 